Strange Wills. Stories of Strange Wills made by strange people. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor, Warren William. And featuring Loreen Tuttle, Perry Ward, with Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast. And the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins. Hate, jealousy, anger, revenge, envy, greed, and lust. And here is our distinguished star of radio, screen, and stage, Warren William. Strange wills are stories of strange and unusual testaments many of which, when read between the lines, bring to light stories of dramatic intensity that defy our imagination. Names, places, and time have all been changed so that no reflection can fall on any person or persons living or dead. The masterpieces of fiction pale in comparison to the stark drama found in man's last official act on earth, his last will and testament. You'll see what I mean in just a moment, but first, let's listen to a few words from your announcer. And now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Treasure to Starboard. This is a story of sunken treasure, of blood-red rubies, sparkling diamonds, and lustrous pearls. But these were but a part of this priceless treasure trove. There were golden statues of pagan gods encrusted with precious stones. There were amethysts, opals, and gold. 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 On the night of March 12th, in the year 1703, some 400 miles off the coast of the West Indies, the Spanish three-master Toledo was foundering in the grip of a tremendous hurricane. In his cabin, Captain Fernandez was hurriedly drafting his last will and testament. He and his crew knew that death rode the gigantic waves and that hope of survival was an improbability. I can sign my body to the elements and my soul to the loving and tender arms of the Holy Mother and to some valiant adventurer whose heart beats with a lost of a Midas I give the treasure on board my ship our position is longitude oeste we're it's about to burn the ship captain hurry hurry no Jose I shall stay go all of you And may heaven protect you. For over 200 years, men have been searching for the treasure aboard the Toledo. But not one clue was ever found until one afternoon, a young, dashing, seafaring friend of mine, Captain Paul London, called me from some little island in the West Indies. I can't tell you more than that, John. I'm afraid of eavesdroppers. But I know I'm on the right track. I'll not you just as I say, and I'll expect you both here next Sunday. So long, John. So Paul had discovered a clue to the treasure ship Toledo. Phew. It had me excited. I could see quarts of rubies, packs of diamonds. Well, who wouldn't get excited? I lost no time in contacting the person whose name he had given me, a certain Gene Medford. Hello? 
I'd like to speak to Mr. Gene Medford, please. Well, the name is right, but the sex is wrong, mister. <laughs> what do you mean? I happen to be a female, a girl one, and a rather pretty one, too. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Miss Medford. I had no idea when I talked with Paul. Paul? Paul, you haven't talked with Paul London, have you? He less than ten minutes ago. He called me from some little town called Rosarita. Oh, and just what has the traveling Mr. London got up his sleeve today? <laughs> And by the way, I'd like to know who I'm talking to. <laughs> of course, I'm sorry. I am John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law, and a personal friend of our mutual friend. Oh, well, that's better. Now then, Mr. O'Connell, what does the great Paul want this time? It's quite a large order, my lady. He wants you to prepare and pack a great deal of special equipment. Now, let's see. Where's the list he gave me? Oh, here it is. Your filtered ultraviolet light machine, a quantity of hydrothiocyanic acid... Well, all the materials and gadgets one uses in the examination of questioned uh, documents. And after I've done all that, then what do I do, please? Then, my dear Miss Medford, I am to take you to the airport and fly you bodily to the lair of Paul London. You... Why, that's ridiculous. I simply won't be let off by the nose on any wild goose chase of his. No, I refuse. <laughs> I won't go. Paul is on, on the trail of a buried treasure, Miss Medford. And I can guarantee you that if you're a good girl and come peacefully, that perhaps... Perhaps before this is over, you can wear rubies on your nightgown and dissolve real pearls in your bath. Rubies on my nightgown and pearls in my bath? Hmm. When do we start? Tomorrow night. I'll pick you up about five, and then we're off to high adventure. Fasten your seat, Jean. We're over Rosarita, and I don't know what kind of a field this is going to be. Oh, gee, I'm excited. Take it easy now. No crash landing. My nerves are on edge. Uh, so am I. Hang on. We're going down. I'm ready. Well, I found this little nautical museum here quite by accident, and I ran across something that made my hair stand on end. In one of the exhibits, I found two pieces of evidence that sent me to the telephone and my call to John. Well, for heaven's sake, don't keep us in suspense any longer, Paul. What's in this exhibit that makes you think you know where the Toledo lies? Wait, wait, John. Talk in a whisper. There are some strange-looking characters all loose in this country. We can't be too careful. If this news ever got around... Looking but... for an alibi already, no, Paul? No, of course not. I'll tell you what I found. I found the water-soaked log of the Toledo... Every word has been washed out by seawater except the ship's name carved on the cover. Ah, I'm beginning to see the light, and, uh, and Jean here with all her paraphernalia. That's right. Modern science will let us read that log. And if the captain of the Toledo lived up to the code of the sea... We will find the position of his ship when she went down. Well, so far, so good. Huh. But how does Paul intend to get the log? We'll leave that to my gentle uh, but persuasive administrations. The main thing is this. I'm going to get possession of the log of the Toledo for one night only... Gene, I want you to set up your apparatus here in this hotel room and wait until I return. Well, how about me, Skipper? Need any help? No, John, I think I can handle this alone. Remember now, I'll be back in two hours. Have everything ready. And supposing the handsome male lead shouldn't come back? <laughs> well, in that event, simply fold your tent like the Arabs. And uh, silently steal away. <laughs> right. <laughs> Jean worked feverishly the next hour, getting her chemicals and equipment set up for this exciting moment. And then, quite suddenly... Will you see who it is, please, John? Don't let anyone come in. Very well. Paul! <gasps> Good heavens, you're wounded. Here, let me help you. Paul! Oh, Paul, what happened? The log did... No, I'm all right. It got hit in the shoulder, but, but I've got it. Look. Oh, here, give it to me. John, help Paul get his shirt off. I'll get some antiseptic. Sit down on the bed, Paul. Here. I'll rip this shirt off your shoulder. Easy now. It's just a flesh wound, John. Don't worry about it. What worries me is the, the man who took the shot at me. Did you recognize him? No, and uh, I got a good look at his face, too. He was blonde, solid, had a German face. You don't imagine someone else? No, well, I don't know, John, but there's that chance that someone else is as smart as I. Bragging again, huh? <laughs> Here, now, let me see that wound. Well, no bone smashed. It could have been worse. Hold still while I wash it. Oh! Oh. Sissy, now hold still. Oh. Now I'll bandage. And in two minutes, I'll have you ready to lick your weight in wildcats. <laughs> the way I feel just now, those wildcats would have to be about two days old. 
Jean worked far into the night and without success. Her ultraviolet light proved valueless. Photographs taken of the pages with infrared brought only blank negatives. All of us were frantic. Towards dawn, Jean looked up from her work. Gentlemen, I think I'm a flop. I can't bring out a single word that's ever been written on this paper. It's hopeless, I guess. Oh, Paul. I feel terrible about letting you down. Never mind, Jean. Don't feel too badly. Wait. Wait a minute. Here. There's one more chance. John, get me a handful of soot out of the fireplace. Put it in this dish for me. One handful of soot coming up. Thank you. Now, John, come over to the table with me. Paul, you lie there and rest. Okay, Duchess. I'm going to plug in this special ray lamp. It throws a pinhole light. It must be parallel to the page in the log. If there's one single solitary indentation left, it'll bring it out. Now then, Mr. Barrister, out with the lights. I'll take a page at random for our experiment. Hand me this soot, please. One order of soot. Over. Easy. You can't see this, Paul, but I'm blowing a pinch of soot over the page. Just a very fine coating. It'll work its way into any depression on the page. Now I'm letting the pinhole of light traverse across the page. Look, Jean. I see a part of a letter forming. It makes a distinct shadow under the light. It's working. It's working. Take it easy. It's too, too early to crow. Say, if you think I'm going to lie here on the bed while you two solve the mystery of the log of the Toledo, you're both nuts. It is working. Look, look. There's an S. A, Y. Oh, good. Now I'm going over to the back of the book and work forward. We've got to find the final entry. More so, please. Lots more. Page after page. Page after page. Our faces were drawn and haggard. And then... Here it is. I've raised some more shadows. Oh, Paul, John. We found the last page of the log. The next few minutes will tell the story. It looks like a number. It is. It's, it's a six and a two after it. Sixty-two. That must be longitude. Yes, of course, longitude, 62 degrees. Here comes the rest. What is it, Jean? It looks like a one. I can't be sure. And the next number is... Um... You will remain seated, please. Carlos, turn on the light. See si, me, Commandant. If you would avoid personal danger, you will not attempt to interfere. You see, I am armed. Mm -hmm. Good. Now then, permit me to introduce myself. I am Herr Gustav Richter, late U-boat commander in the German Navy. Well, for... Were we supposed to say Heil Hitler? The war is over, the big one. But unless you leave this island immediately, a new one will start. Because, as you might know, we are both after the same thing. Now then, Carlos, you will take the book from the young lady's hands. Si, senor. Fraulein, the last number you are trying so hard to read. Maybe it's best if you don't find it. It will save us all a lot of trouble. Aquí, comandante, the book. Herr Richter, there are international rules of law governing Quiet. it. There are also local laws providing against breaking into and stealing public documents. I warn you most seriously. The treasure of the Toledo will be mine, and mine alone. If you should be foolish enough to interfere, I don't have to tell you what will happen. Thank you, and good night. Well, of all the crazy... Take it easy, Paul. He looks like he might be serious. Evidently, you weren't the only one who found the clue to the lost Toledo. I can see those rubies on my nightgown walking right out of the window. And those pearls in my bath. I knew it sounded too good. Not yet, Jean. I think that Herr Gustav Richter, late commander of the German Navy, is going to have some rough sailing ahead before he finds the sunken treasure. And by everything that's holy, we three are going to give it to him. Part two of Strange Wills will continue in just a moment.
And now back to Warren William and Treasure to Starboard. For the next three days, the cables between our island home and New York were kept exceptionally busy. Before the end of the week, huge quantities of deep-sea diving gear were being flown into Rosarita. We tried to trace our German friend, but he couldn't be found. I felt certain that we'd meet Herr Richter again, but I hoped we'd be more than ready for him. About two weeks later, when the last of our equipment was delivered, we called a meeting of our augmented crew who were hired to man our ship. Some of them were imported from the States. They wore campaign ribbons and, <laughs> well, you know our sailors. And we've got to be prepared for everything. Our ship is a floating arsenal as well as a scientific laboratory. Our treasure prize is high, and every one of us will share it if we find it. Are you ready? You yes, bet we are, sir. sir. Yes, sir. We'll go okay, then. Ship. We'll leave port in an hour. I'll see you all on board. In the captain's quarters aboard our ship, Paul, Jean, and I had another meeting. I've got it all figured out to almost a mathematical certainty. I can bring this ship within ten miles of where the Toledo went down. The rest is pure luck. Do you think the Jerry's know we sailed, Paul? That I don't know, but the word will get back to Herr Richter. Don't you worry. Maybe he's already on the way. But so what? How's he going to get there? Maybe he has a ship. Maybe he can use his sub. I don't know that. But getting there and staying there are going to be two different things. He'll find out. We spent two quiet, uneventful days sailing to our destination. If it hadn't been for the tenseness on board, I could have had a lovely time. But with diamonds, rubies, and buried treasure, and a battle in the offing, well, how could anyone hope to rest? Near the end of the second day... Come in. Just picked up this message, sir. It's from the SS Juniper, bound for Boston. Thank you. SS Juniper reports sighting a strange submarine at 14 o'clock. Craft heading northeast by east. Refuse to reply to radiogram. May possibly be an escaped Nazi sub. Be alert. Huh. Well, there's our answer. Herr Richter's on the way. We better be ready tomorrow when we meet him on the floor of the ocean. We arrived at our calculated position sometime during the light and lay to. No sooner had we dropped our anchors than the crew took to the boats and began sounding operations to determine the depth of the water around us. They reported just at dawn. Average depth from 30 to 90 fathoms, sir. We found a sharp decline about a quarter mile east. We were unable to reach bottom at that point, but our charts show this to be a part of the Great Fissure, one of the deepest points in the entire Atlantic. Thanks, Pete. Tell the first mate that I'll go down as soon as I've had breakfast. Tell him to have the gear ready. Aye, aye, sir. After breakfast, Paul donned his gear and went over the side. Jean and I stood by the air pump and wondered what would happen below. Was the sub lying there? Would they locate the rotting hull of the Toledo? Would they find the treasure before us? These were anxious moments. Paul kept in constant touch through our sea phone. Paul? Paul, can you hear me? Still going down. Getting darker. Turning on my pressure light. Now on the bottom. Oh, John, so far so good. Yes, Jean, so far so good. The wreck ahead, not our ship, has two stacks circling to avoid fouling airline. Reach the edge of the outer fissure. We'll follow it. Water beyond fissure, very black, very deep. Try not to slip. Oh, Paul, darling, don't talk like that or I'll make you come right up. <laughs> I'll be careful, sweetheart. Just past the shark. He sends his regards to Johnny Weismuller. <laughs> we'll see that he doesn't send you along for a greeting card. Oh, I see the wreck on the edge of the great fissure. It's an old one, covered with sand. Send down sand gun on rope. It's coming right down, darling. Quick, he wants a sand gun sent down to him. It's on the way, Paul. Be careful now. Going to blow a little sand away to see if I can discover the identity of the ship. John. John, come here, please. Listen. Listen to the phone. Do you hear anything? Let me listen. Paul. 
Paul, this is John. Listen, come up at once. The sub is in the vicinity. We've just picked up the sound vibrations. Hurry, man. Hurry. I feel it too, John. Just a minute more. I'm getting a piece off this old hull. I'll bring it up. Okay, I've got it. Raise away. Start the wind. She's coming up. Hurry. Three minutes of maddening delay, and then I saw his helmet break water. As busy hands unbolted his helmet, he gave us a little net, which he held in his hand. We took it eagerly, and there it was. A piece of old, decayed wood. But on it was a small brass plate, some old, rusted fitting that had uh, seen the ocean bottom for many a year. I gave it to Jean, and she hurried to the laboratory to take off the corrosion. Naturally, I hurried with her. It's coming off. I can almost make it out, John. Let me see, there's an L, an O, T. Here it is, Toledo. The Toledo, we found it, we found it. Oh, John, I'm so happy. Let's hurry and tell Paul. After Paul came out of the decompression chamber, he told us his story. He's lying at the very edge of the fissure. We must be very careful or it's possible that it may disappear entirely. There are tons of sand to be blown out, and then, well, then we'll know the answer. But what about the sub, Paul? Good heavens, you don't mean to start blowing out sand with a mad German sitting alongside of you. Now we have to take that chance. I think we're better equipped, and if we work fast, we can be out of here in two days, even before he finds out where the Toledo is lying. Right now, we have to float a buoy over the spot and pull out of here. Maybe we can throw them off the track. We'll come back later and then go to work. <laughs> Under the cover of darkness, we crept back to our position. Paul and two divers went over the side to begin the hazardous task of uncovering the ship. We agreed on complete silence, unless an emergency arose. I'll never forget how long that night lasted. Along about midnight, our worst fears were realized. Jean, Jean, the sub is on the prowl. Listen. We've got to let him know. We've got to warn him. Yes, yes, tell him. Paul? Paul? Can you hear me? Paul? Can't stop the talk now. We're inside ship. The uncovered iron chests. Hold on. He won't listen, John. He won't listen. Wait a minute. John. I can't... I can't hear the sub. It stopped. Probably gone out of range. Treasure to starboard. Treasure to starboard. We found the treasure of the Toledo. Did you hear, John? They found it. They found the treasure of the Toledo. Paul? Paul, answer me. Paul? Oh, John, something's gone wrong. The line is dead. Paul, answer. Are you all right? Paul? Paul? Five interminable minutes dragged by on leaden feet. Not a sound came from Paul or from the divers down there with him. What had happened? How could we know? Then... They came out of the escape hatch. They're surrounding... Take this phone, John. Don't stop listening for a moment. Jean ran the length of the ship and disappeared. Paul's position was most precarious. We couldn't drop a depth charge. We couldn't do anything to help. I kept trying to reach Paul on the phone, but the line was apparently dead. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a diving helmet disappear over the side of our ship. I looked round for Jean. She was gone. And then I realized, too late, that she... I gave the earphones to a sailor and ran down the deck. Who was that? Went over the side just now. That was Miss Medford, sir. She insisted on going down. You fool! Why did you let her do that? Well, she said she was the only one who knew how to detonate the underwater bomb, sir. So that was it. Little Jean Medford going down to lick the sub crew single-handed. What a fool. What a brave, glorious little fool. I prayed as I had never prayed before. Everyone aboard leaned over the side of the ship, silently looking down into the dark blue of the water. What was happening down there? Then, 200 yards off our stern, we saw an oil slick spread on the surface. She'd done it. she destroyed the sub. And what of the crew? It was either surrender or death. Later, Paul told us the story. We saw them coming at us just after we'd uncovered the treasure. They had special equipment, compressed air helmets without airlines attached. They held long steel pikes in their hands. 
In the glow of our lights, we could see the outline of the sub. I thought sure it was curtains, till I saw someone sneak up to the sub and drop something down the escape hatch. The explosion knocked us all flat. Then I looked around. I saw the sub roll on its side, and at Toledo, well, she had entirely disappeared. The blast had sent it tumbling down the fissure. The treasure went with it. And the Germans? <laughs> For all I know, they're still walking back to land. And so ended the quest for treasure to starboard. Jean didn't get her rubies and pearls after all, but she's still very well satisfied because shortly after we return to the state... And do you, Jean Medford, take this man to be your lawful wedded husband through sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, until death do you part? I do. Then, by virtue of the authority vested in me, I pronounce you man and wife. Darling. Well, I did manage to get one diamond anyway, didn't I, dearest? Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you more about Treasure to Starboard. But first, here is a word from your announcer. And here again is Warren William. Little did Captain Fernandez realize as he wrote his last will and testament in the ship's log on the night of March 12, 1703, that over 200 years later, men would still fight and die to recover the treasure that went down with him to the bottom of the sea. Will the treasure of the Toledo ever be relocated? Well, it depends on science and the brave daring of intrepid adventurers. We've managed to reach the straightest fear... Why not the unknown depths of the sea? Especially when it holds not one, but hundreds of treasures of inestimable value. Who will risk their lives to recover them? Will you? Next week, I'm going to tell you the story about a professor who believed that heredity is stronger than environment. Unfortunately, he put his nefarious belief to an actual test that involved the life of an innocent child. In order to prove his point to a doubting scientific world, the professor married a woman in whose veins coursed criminal blood for many generations. From this unholy union, a child was born, born to be reared as a lady. But from the very first, strange signs of bad blood cropped up in the child. What happened to her? Well, listen next week to the story we call One Shining Hour. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. Hollywood.